I'm John Banther, and this is Classical Breakdown. From WETA Classical in Washington, we're your guide to classical music. In this episode, I'm joined by WETA Classical's Evan Keeley, and we're exploring a work by Haydn that features four soloists at the same time, his Sinfonia Concertante. After looking at the definition, we show you what to listen for and why Haydn wrote in such a playful manner. Plus, we even have a moment in the music that is completely unnecessary. I keep forgetting to mention some of the great emails we receive simply because I forget things, like how I should have mentioned that Tim N., fan of the show, recommended the Dvorak episode, so I wanted to actually read something real nice, real quick, before we start, also related to that Dvorak episode. Teresa K. wrote, A few weeks ago, I came across your podcast, and since then, I have been listening to one episode after another. Well, thank you so much, Teresa, and we love starting with a compliment. That's always best. She continues, Coming from the Czech Republic, I especially enjoyed the recent episode about Antonin Dvorak's life. As you mentioned, he is still very beloved in our country. This year, we celebrate the Year of Czech Music as the four in 2024 marks many anniversaries in the field of Czech music. Last Saturday, March 2nd, the main celebrations began with an homage to Bedrik Smetana's 200 years birth jubilee. That is amazing, Teresa. Thank you so much. And sorry if you're cringing at how I maybe mispronounced Metina's name, but uh, that was very enlightening. I had no idea the number four was so significant, and I'll put a link on the show notes page, what she sent to me, that shows all of this in depth. It's really something. I'm really glad that people enjoyed that Dvorak episode as much as I enjoyed being a part of it. Yes. Okay, so Franz Josef Haydn's Sinfonia Concertante, which was an episode recommended by Andrew R. So first off, what is... Sinfonia and Concertante, what is this together? We can look at the Harvard Dictionary of Music, and, well, Evan, you went to Harvard, so why don't you read this? In the 18th and early 19th centuries, a type of concerto for two or more solo instruments and orchestra. Though called sinfonias, these works belong, with few exceptions, to the history of the concerto. The style tends generally toward the light and popular rather than the heroic or grand. In the 19th century, the term Sinfonia Concertante fell into disuse, comparable works being designated by such titles as Triple Concerto by Beethoven, The Concertstück by Robert Schumann, or The Double Concerto by Brahms. That's a really nice definition here because we see how it's, well, related more to the concerto. We see some aspects like it's more light and popular rather than um, grand. And it's also a title that seems to have been in a time and place. Just in this time and period in the late 1700s, because afterwards, as you said, they just choose, well, it's a triple concerto. Right. So the the form is not necessarily changing, but the title is changing. And as we also see in this passage from the Harvard Dictionary of Music that I just read, uh, this light style is definitely applicable to this work by Haydn that we're going to be looking at today. Yes. And I really hear this Sinfonia Concertante idea as an expansion on something from many decades earlier in the Baroque period, the Concerto Grosso, like when a composer like Handel would write for a couple of soloists and a small ensemble, and they're passing these lines around. And the phenomena of these ideas coming back 50 years later, that has never stopped. You may have noticed the disco clap coming back in style in music. We have uh, maybe Dua Lipa's levitating to thank for that, and that'll fade away soon in a couple of years, too, I imagine. The more things change, the more they remain the same. And he composed this in February and March of 1792 after being invited to London by a famous concert organizer and violinist at the time, Johann Salomon, if I can even say his name right. Yes, Johann Peter Salomon invited Haydn to come to London, and he arrived there in 1791 and was there for about a year and a half. Huge success for Haydn and for Salomon, the organizer. And this was one of the pieces that Haydn wrote on that first trip to London. So let's jump right into the music. We have multiple soloists, and Haydn writes these solos for violin, cello, bassoon, and oboe. And from the beginning, the orchestra and the string soloists, they start together in the introduction and then they subtly emerge 
from the orchestra like a half a minute or so later. But before that melody, Evan, you pointed something out to me that really struck a chord with me, um, maybe a pun intended, I don't know, but there is a little motif that happens before the main theme comes in, and that's this two eighth notes on a downbeat. Right. This is a very Haydn-esque thing, isn't it, John? This mm-hmm. is a characteristic style. Bump, bump on the downbeat. Dun, two, three, four. Bump, bump, two, three, four. Bump, bump. You hear that a lot in this first movement, and uh, it's a very simple little thing. It's a little rhythmic thing, but you hear it a lot, and it's just one of those ways that Haydn has of keeping the music exciting. It really adds a rhythmic forward motion to it. And then the oboe starts off with this very simple motif, and it gets passed around, and like that motif you were just mentioning, it comes back again and again. And it's like uh, almost like in a story, in a novel, if you think of uh, Vonnegut, and so it goes. Right. But one thing I want to point out right away is you'll notice that light and playful character is right from the beginning. You'll notice that the first time... The oboe plays this theme, but not as many instruments or soloists jump in right away. It's like the oboe has to come back and coax them along, and then they're more willing to uh, jump in together. One of the things that Haydn does that makes this piece so exciting and fun and interesting is the way the soloists sometimes are all playing together, but very often you have one come in and then another will do something that imitates that, and then the little duets, and uh, they're, all, they're, they're not all playing together necessarily in, in a way that really keeps it interesting. And after the introduction, the soloists are really fully leading the music. And listen for how Haydn combines these instruments. Sometimes it's winds, like bassoon and oboe solo, against the string soloists, violin and cello. Sometimes it's a different mixture. Sometimes they're really just dovetailing each other. Listening to this with more intent, because it's been a, quite a while since I've really listened to this intently, this piece. But this time, these moments, they take on a kind of operatic feeling for me almost a quartet at times or a duet i think of a funny fun moment at a mozart opera towards the end there's definitely an operatic quality to this whole piece and you might even say to the sinfonia concertante genre in general uh you think of the famous mozart violin and viola sinfonia concertante and it's like a duet uh these two characters and you'll hear a lot of operatic twists in this haydn piece as well And Haydn adds playfulness and lighthearted nature to this with some musical, I don't want to say tricks or gimmicks, but devices. One of them we know from Haydn is starting and stopping the music. Sometimes in a symphony he would stop, and you might think it's over and people would would, would clap or something. But he starts and stops here in a way that makes it feel very self-aware to my ears. Like, oh, wait. Oh, now we can go. Yeah, he really makes you pay attention with these unison rests that he throws in. And interesting moments in the harmony as well. Yeah, there's this weird chord uh, about three minutes in, and uh, we're in this sort of strange place. Uh, You know, it's a a D-flat major first inversion chord. We're in B-flat major, and I could get into the music theory and lots of detail there, but it's, it's it's a related harmony, but it's kind of distant from the main key, and it sounds a little... Uh, for lack of a better term, funky, mm-hmm. and yet it, it fits right in. It's just it's, it's this crazy thing that happens, and yet it seems like it's exactly what should have happened. And it's a very Haydn-esque gesture, it seems to me. It does really grab you, and it sounds like, oh, we're going into some kind of development section with lots of extra harmony and, and sounds that aren't to our key of B-flat major, but then it goes back before we get to that development-type section where the music is really taking on uh, or really going on to different paths, straying from the path of uh, B-flat major. So we were speaking earlier about this two eighth notes on a downbeat, bump, bump, two, three, four, dum, dum. And you have a lot of this with Haydn, and especially in this piece, one of the things I really love about it is you have this thematic material, then he breaks it down into smaller pieces, and you can really see how Beethoven picked this up. Uh, Beethoven, of course, studied with Haydn for a brief period when Beethoven was a young man. And Haydn's really a master of this, of taking thematic material, breaking it down into smaller bits, and then toward the end of the movement, you have these fuller statements of thematic materials once again. But it's a way of keeping the music flowing and and adding excitement. I like that, because you do hear moments where it's like, 
all of a sudden it's like, oh wait, is that that's like a seed of Beethoven? If I took that yeah. rhythm outside and put it in the ground and watered it, Beethoven would sprout up or something. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it, John. And the transitions, even though sometimes it's like start and stop, it's very smooth. You're kind of into the next section before you realize it. It has, um, for me, it's kind of delightful and self-aware. I hope that comes across the way I mean it because there's a, there's a type of feeling to this music like it knows what it's doing. This is to have fun. You know, it's a very self-indulgent type of work, too. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot we could say about this. Haydn is really at the height of his powers at this phase of his life. Mm -hmm. And he's there in London. He, at this point, he'd been there for about a year, a little over a year. People absolutely loved him. It was, a, it was a great success for him personally and professionally. So you can really see him just feeling very confident in himself when he writes this piece. And... A concerto usually has at least one cadenza, right? So how does that work when you have four soloists on stage? At times, I think the cadenza is in part the whole orchestra stops and they're basically playing the orchestra parts themselves and the solo parts. But they also slow down. It gives the music and each other room to breathe. There's a lot of um, dramaticism in here as well. And this is a piece that is fun to listen to, but also great to see in concert because the way the soloists will be interacting with each other in these little moments. Right. And like you were saying, this is where a cadenza would be where a solo instrument would very often improvise in the 18th century. And, of course, you have four instrumentalists. I guess they could, but Haydn writes it all out. I especially love this dramatic, there's this unison F to G flat. There's, you don't have a lot of unison uh, in this piece, and so when you hear it, it's really striking. And it's a weird sort of, this G flat is this funny note. It's like a Dizzy Gillespie wrong note almost. Uh, and uh, it, really, it really grabs your attention. And uh, that, that just, like you said, John, that playful way of the, the four of them just having a fun together toward the end of the movement with this cadenza is, is really just, uh, it's, it's, it's a very joyful kind of feeling. And how they get out of the cadenza is really fun because you hear these trills and, I mean, how many cadenzas do we hear? Most of them really, you hear this trill on the solo instrument and then that ushers in the accompaniment back in and then you, you know, frolic to the end of the movement. And here we have the trills, the instruments are coming in, but then the bassoon has this really fun up and down line that breaks that up. Before the orchestra comes back in. And the best part about this is the bassoon line is completely unnecessary. If you take this out and just have the trills and go to the end of the movement, well, this is what it sounds like. Now you have to pretend in your mind that bassoon was trilling as well, but if that was in the concert, I can't imagine anyone would even bat an eye. Right. It sounds fine. Yeah. And yet Haydn adds that extra little sauce that gives it an additional zing. And, you know, it's it's fun, it's humorous, it's delightful, but it doesn't have a kind of frivolous or self-indulgent quality to it. If I had to describe this as a cookie, it would be a cookie that you're eating, and halfway through you say, hmm, what is that, nutmeg? Exactly. There's a little added spice that just gives it that, oh, wait a minute, this is even more interesting than I realized. So this is a concerto, or contratante, that I can't imagine the audience not clapping, at least after the first movement. And you might think that audiences disagreeing on when to applaud is a new phenomenon, you know, limited to, um, you know, Facebook arguments, but it's been around for a while. There's a really fantastic letter someone wrote who was at this concert who saw this premiere it is truly wonderful what sublime and august thoughts this master weaves into his works passages often occur which make it impossible to listen without becoming excited we are altogether carried away by admiration and forced to applaud with hand and mouth this is especially the case with frenchmen of whom there are so many here that all the public places are filled with them London was filling with aristocratic refugees from the French Revolution. You know that they have great sensibility and cannot restrain their transports, so that in the middle of the finest passages, in the soft adagios, 
They clap their hands in loud applause and thus mar the effect. Yeah, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Uh, We're arguing about this today, and we argued about it in the 19th and the 18th centuries and so forth. And uh, how do you behave in a concert when you're just so thrilled by the music? Do you sit there in silent reverence and enjoy the music silently? Well, there's something to be said for that, but Mm -hmm. sometimes you just got to go, woohoo, and Haydn really understands this. There is another mention of this concert, um, a kind of review, The last performance at Solomon's concert deserves to be mentioned as one of the richest treats which the recent concert season has afforded. A new concertante from Haydn, combined with all the excellencies of music. It was profound, airy, affecting, and original, and the performance was in unison with the merit of the composition. Well, I mean, that's we're going to become a broken record because that's a lot of what this piece is. It's just fun. It's original in Haydn's own way, and the performance was great. Yeah, and Haydn, of course, uh, among his many, among the many aspects of Haydn's genius, he was very shrewd. Mm -hmm. He knew how to write music that would be appealing. He was a genius. He wrote music that was very profound, but he also knew how to sell concert tickets. He knew how to get people excited and to sell scores. And this was an effort to compete in a very competitive musical environment. London, 1792, there's these concert series that are happening. And he wants to draw a crowd, and he wants to write something people are going to like. And he really succeeds brilliantly. And there's two sides of that coin as a musician. You, you're trying to write something to please an audience. I mean, we'll just leave that there. You're trying to write something to please an audience, but also... You want to please the concert presenter, yes. right? You want to make them the more happy the audience is coming up after the concert saying, that was amazing, the happier they are. And maybe that's why Solomon, the concert organizer, was the violin soloist in the concert. And it sounds like the violin has a lot of juicy moments. The violin is really the star. I mm-hmm. mean, it's not like the four soloists are equal in the entire piece. For much of it, they are. But mm-hmm. uh, Solomon definitely gets to shine in this, in this performance. And the performance we're hearing is a recording featuring the Austro-Hungarian Haydn Orchestra with conductor Adam Fischer. And they've recorded all of the symphonies and more, I'm pretty sure, including this, in the actual Haydn Hall at the Esterhazy Palace, where Haydn himself was living and writing and premiering works for the you know royal court at this palace. So I love that we get to hear the hall, at least in some way. You can hear the a sense of the space in the recording. And, you know, Haydn would have no idea this could ever be possible, I imagine. And I doubt he ever even heard this piece in that hall. Probably not. Probably not. It's worth remembering, too, John, when Haydn was in London, he had larger forces to work with than mm-hmm. he had had when he worked at Esterhazy, uh, the Esterhazy Palace, for decades. That's true. They had a great ensemble there, great musicians to work with uh, Esterhaza. But in London, it was even more of a goldmine for him. So he really just, you know, went to town, as it were. Yes. So looking at the second movement now, this one feels like a competition as to who can be the most delicate. And I'll be honest, there's not a lot of music from this time period in this kind of soft, delicate nature that I'm always in love with, but there's something about this one that's just, it's nice and pleasing. Yeah, it's just this gorgeous lyricism, very simple melody, so beautiful. You have this pizzicato strings in the orchestra at the beginning, so the soloists really get to shine. And it's just so affecting and so hypnotic and beautiful. And we've talked a little bit about the soloists and how they're playing together or being broken up into differing forces. The cello and violin swap roles. You think the cello, the lower instrument, it plays, you know, arpeggiated lines and accompaniment to a solo over top. Well, he flips it. So the violin is playing these moving arpeggiated lines while the um, cello has its own solo. This solo and many other moments has moments that I think the musicians can really lean into. And that happens with the harmony and just the way he writes these um, melodies. But there's something very, you know, dolce, sweet when you get to lean into something like that. One of the things I love about Haydn, he writes this music that's so expressive, but it's never sentimental. It's never cloying. He just hits the right balance. And the horn in this movement, Evan, I actually 
like forget the horn is even playing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden in, in this movement, it plays a more, um, I don't want to say important, but a, a bigger role. Well, you were saying earlier, John, about the cookie and you're eating a cookie and then mm. you suddenly realize there's this extra spice that you hadn't noticed before. And the yeah. horns, the two horns in this, uh, in this movement, they're silent for much of the movement. And then they suddenly come in and they just play this one long note, the two of them in unison, Bum, and they just hold this long note, and it just adds this color and texture to the whole overall sound in such a subtle but such a perfect way. And there is also a cadenza moment in this as well, and I, I'm kind of using that word loosely, cadenza. But this is a fun part because we hear the soloists together on a high, delicate line. It's It feels very uplifted, but you get the idea that one of these instruments feels left out and it's trying to get their attention and it's the cello they kind of have to repeat again and again before everyone joins in and moves on to the next part right the cello has this big solo in this piece but then later on the other three soloists are playing the cello kind of gets left out but then joins in it's it's a really wonderful balance and a big moment here is the orchestra is playing the theme, and it's the first time that they're really stepping out um, in this way. It's been the, the soloist, and because we've had that absence and just lighter accompaniment with like those uh, with that horn line, this really adds a whole big sound. And it's uh, it's poignant too, I think, because it's so brief. You know, the orchestra just plays this one phrase of this main theme of the movement, and then the orchestra fades back into the accompanimental role and the violin and cello, they reverse their roles from that earlier duet. Now the violin is a soloist with the cello playing that arpeggiated accompaniment. This is a movement that's decadent, it knows it, and I guess more dessert talk, you know, I might compliment this by saying, oh, you know, it's not too sweet. Right, it's just right. So let's talk more about the sound of this and the playful and, and sweetness of it. It's filled with these affecting and self-gratifying lines, but why? Why was Haydn writing this like this to get everyone's love and infatuation and a big applause in a concert? Well, it's probably because he had a student um, play L. And I'm sure Haydn was very proud of the student because Playel became very successful. So successful, he was putting pressure on Haydn in London because they were both premiering works there, and Playel was getting very popular with the audiences. And in fact, Playel wrote Sinfonia Contratantes II. One was played earlier this same year and got great reviews in the London papers. Right. He was quite popular uh, in his day. Playel better remembered today as a piano designer. But a very popular composer in his lifetime, and as you pointed out, John, a student of Haydn's earlier, and they were friends. And then they were both thrust into this situation in London where they were rivals. Mm -hmm. There was a rival concert series, and Playel was kind of the star of the rival series. And uh, I think the two of them handled it in a very gentlemanly way. But one of the ways you see that is Haydn is like, oh, well, Playel's had great success with these Sinfonia Contratante style pieces. I'll write one too. And uh, he's not trying to make Playel look bad. He's just saying, hey, listen, I want to join the party too. And they both were successful writing in that style. And we'll get into the third movement right after this. Okay, now I mentioned opera or operatic ideas or qualities in that first movement. The third movement is truly operatic. This opening is dramatic. It's like the diva soloist, you know, jumps on stage into their big recitative moment, their big dramatic moment. Yes, very operatic writing here, and the violin is the diva. And everyone gets their turn, the bassoon, the cello, and the oboe. But as we've learned, Peter Solomon, the um, person signing the check, playing the violin, got a lot of um, attention and writing. And in another review, 
It says, Haydn directed for the first time the performance of a new concertante, the third movement of which seemed expressly calculated to show the brilliancy of Salomon's and the sweetness of his tone. The prevailing manner of this master pervaded every moment. It had all of his usual grandeur, contrasted by the levity of airy transition and the sudden surprises of abrupt rests. The company were very brilliant. And honestly, it sounds like the, the critic is trying to sell the music as well. Yeah, the critic seems to like both the composition and the performance. And it's easy to believe, obviously, the composition is great. And from what we know about Peter Zalaman as a violinist, he was really good. What a pairing to have this great composer and this great player together on the stage. Bassoon comes in, oboe comes in, and the cello isn't doing a whole lot until it gets um, it gets its own moment. And it feels like, Evan, a lot of the solo moments for the cello sound quite high. It sounds like he's writing in the high tessitura register. Really high in the range of the instrument, yes. Trills have played some fun roles in this piece, and this is one where it almost feels like, oh, is this like a seat of Beethoven, where the orchestra gets this turbulent, brooding um, trill that's just this brief transitional moment, but it feels like, oh my gosh, almost like this is what Beethoven is standing on, basically. Yeah, definitely. And it ushers in a kind of surprising moment. Right. There's this unexpected twist harmonically and thematically. It seems like we're just about to end the piece. And then there's this, oh, not quite. We've got one more thing to say. But then instead of going off in this whole other direction, it just brings us back to the home key and brings us to the end of the piece. But it's just this little surprise, so Haydn-esque in that, you know, bringing in the unexpected in a way that's so delightful. As you said, Haydn is really at the height here. He's in his late 50s. He's got nothing to prove. And we just see so many of these Haydn-esque ideas poured into here. The playfulness, the starting and stopping also towards the end. It is a fun work to listen to. But as I said, seeing the interaction of the soloists on stage in these playful moments is what really elevates the experience. So if you ever get a chance to see it, do so. And I'll also put a video on the um, show notes page as well. Now, if you enjoyed this one, you will probably love the one by his student Playel that was made earlier in the year in 1792. It's an F major. I I don't know if you've heard it, Evan, but it is, it's really, 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 really good. Playel is a really fine composer, uh, perhaps not quite of the titanic stature of his teacher, Josef Haydn, but uh, a composer definitely worth knowing and listening to. He had his finger on the pulse, and Haydn knew that, and I think that's what uh, brought us here. Well, thank you so much, Evan, for joining me for Haydn's Sinfonia Concertante. Great opportunity to dig deeper into this delightful piece. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown, your guide to classical music. For more information on this episode, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. You can send me comments and episode ideas to classicalbreakdown at weta.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, leave a review in your podcast app. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from WETA Classical.